If you were to introduce your son to the world, what would you say? I would say he is funny and vivacious and he has a great sense of humor. He loves people. He loves hearing about other people. And he is just, he's smart and adorable. He's just pure joy. He wakes up in the morning and he's got a huge smile on his face for you. Like every morning, he, he has every reason to not want to get up and do things. He's got, you know, he's, he's lost so much. He's lost his ability to walk, his ability to crawl. <laughs> and yet, he's just pure happiness. I notice he smiles really big when you look in his eyes. He will really communicate with face gestures and gazes and he understands. He reads faces very well. So, <laughs> what are you laughing at? What are you even laughing at? <laughs> are we talking about you? He loves so many things in life and he just makes the most out of every little thing and he just he teaches me how to be a better person, how to appreciate the now, how to live in the moment and just how to take nothing for granted. Yeah. You're pretty awesome. I sure love you. Tell me about your son. Tennyson. Uh he's my buddy. He's my little buddy. He's just, uh, I don't know, I'm not great with words. <laughs> what is it like to love a kid like Tens? Uh, overwhelming. You know, it's, there's just so much that you wanna do with them that, that you can't, so it's heartbreaking, but you know, it's, it's hard to describe how you feel about them. You know, I love them so much, it just, it hurts. Huh, yeah. <laughs> we named him after the poet Tennyson, but um, he's known for writing the "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." And so we're just, after we realized all his diagnoses, we're like, "That's we'll call him Tens or Tenzi. <laughs> was a that a little one. too close to home? It hit a little too close, so. Well, it was not our, I liked him for a different poem he did, but we, we decided to just call him Tens or Tenzi. <laughs> it fits him. Do you mind discussing why that hits a little too close to home? Yeah, so um, he was born with 1P36 deletion syndrome and um, Russell Silver's syndrome. Russell Silver's is a form of primordial dwarfism. 1P36 is a little missing piece on a certain chromosome that gives, makes it so he had global delays and seizures and all kinds of other things. When he was one, <laughs> he caught a cold that was really bad cold and he ended up intubated and in the hospital for over a month. And with that cold, his lungs got really scarred because he's also got a form of dwarfism. His lungs don't grow new tissue. So this progressive lung disease is outpacing the growth of new tissue in his lungs. And because of that, he now has end stage lung disease since his lungs are more scarred than actual good tissue. So um, when he was four, almost five, his lung disease got so bad that he coded for 33 minutes and he had no pulse, no heart rate, nothing. They, he, luckily he was in the PICU at the time and the doctors at Randall's Children's Hospital are amazing and they were in the room in a heartbeat. They were already in the room. Um, and they were able to start CPR and they told us they had to stop CPR and they found a pulse right at that point. So they put him on emergency ECMO, which is a heart lung bypass machine. And he was on that for three weeks and we didn't think he was gonna come off that. And if he did come off, we didn't think he'd ever open his eyes again or um, have any kind of meaningful existence, I guess, is what we were told. Um, so we were gonna turn off the machines and he opened his eyes <laughs> and then um, he got sick again and again and again. He just kept getting sick while he was there and we thought that was kind of it. Um, but he rallied <laughs> and we ended up finally going home and his lungs crashed again. They started hemorrhaging. And so we went back in there and that's when they diagnosed him with end stage heart and lung disease and he's vent dependent, he needs oxygen all the time, he can't really come off this, but he's stayed stable for three years. They told us 
you know, get or make a wish right now and celebrate Christmas early. And that was three years ago. So how old is he now? He's eight and he came off ECMO on his fifth birthday. That was how he celebrated his fifth birthday. So he's eight years old and he's going to be nine in February. So whenever he's in the hospital, when I walk in, they go, oh, that's where he gets the hair. <laughs> Do you see a lot of yourself in him? Um, mostly just the hair. I think he looks like his, he looks a lot like my son. I think it was his cardiologist who said, I didn't think he was going to last a year. You know, he was, he used the analogy that he was standing on the ledge, leaning over with one foot off. And at his one year checkup, it was, well, it looks like he's taken one step back from the ledge. So do professionals know why? Oh, of course not. Of course not. It's, it says they have no, no way to explain it. You know, I heard you ask my, my son what he thought, why Tennyson is how he is. And he, he is loved by not only his family, but by everybody who knows him. And I think that sustains him, is that love. And his parents and his brother do so much to make his life as wonderful as it can be. And I think he lives for that. He knows that he doesn't like being in the hospital. He likes being home where he has the things he knows and the people around him. What's your favorite thing to do with your brother? Uh, well, um, he, on his eye gaze, he uh, has this page that's um, watch Brecken play Minecraft. Uh, and he can order me to do things on that, and I have to do that. I also like to read and uh, play outside with him. So he'll go on his eye gaze and boss you around while you're playing Minecraft? What kind of things does he make you do? Die, build a new base, punch a tree. He'll make you self-destruct? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. What do you think when he does that? I uh, was like, uh, better fight a enemy soon, otherwise I'll have to kill myself in the game. Can you tell me about the eye gaze and how he communicates with it? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a bunch of different pages. He uses his get literal eye gaze to look at pictures and he has to look at that picture for a certain amount of time. I think it's like six seconds before it will um, then speak. But once he does, it, it tells what he wants to say and it's he's not really able to control much with his body. Um, but he is able to look at things and talk Inside. and he, he loves having a voice. He doesn't, I don't think he always knows what he's saying or um, always that it's purposeful, but he understands that it's him doing it. Outside. And that just makes him happy to be able to, yeah, I know, outside. We'll go, that one I think he does understand, but. Outside. He understands, he understands what's going on in the world and <laughs> he, he'll just, you know, he likes talking about himself and hearing about himself. That makes him smile. But really, it's not, it's not a difficult task to get him to smile. It was at the beginning of his brain injury. He had a really hard time. He was in a semi-conscious state and it was really hard to break through the fog. But with time and healing and therapies, lots and lots and lots of therapies, he's really come back to us in a lot of ways. When he stopped breathing due to his lungs, that's when the brain injury happened? Yeah, his um, lungs were so bad that he had a cardiac arrest. His um, heart had a pulmonary hypertensive crisis and completely stopped. So, um, yeah, he had no oxygen. He had no anything. And he had already had his trach, so they were able to bag him from his trach. But my husband and I... We're just sitting in that PICU for 33 minutes watching them. And it was like, the doctor was like a captain of a ship. There was so many people in that room and I could just kind of see him going, you know, oh, it's just, it's traumatic to even go there. But it's, you know, I just begged him and then he, they got his pulse back and he coded again, but the, um, only for a couple minutes. And the doctor, she gave him a chance. The surgeon didn't want to, but she did. Is there a gratitude that comes with watching your child code and 
having them in your home again? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm literally every day I'm grateful. Every single day I am. It feels like Christmas knowing that he's still here, he's still fighting, and I know that one day that won't be the case. And it's just, it's, I just really appreciate every second with him. Do you have tips and tricks to stay in the present moment and not perseverate on the future? Um, I don't know. I think my brain just kind of doesn't. <laughs> it just won't. I think there's a whole psychological analysis probably that they could do on this. And you can hear again and again these terminal. And we have moments where, um, you know, he stops breathing and we have to bag him or he has Can you explain what that means? You have to bag him? Yeah, it's a bagging device so we connect to his trach and we artificially breathe for him because the vent's not doing it enough. And um, he's just, his lungs just shut down and we have to reinflate them for him and then eventually he'll kind of pick up and help again, so. What is it like for you when that's happening? Um, it's automatic at this point. I think I just kind of zone out and then afterwards it's- How often does it happen? Like at least once a week we have these issues and then, you know, afterwards it's, it's hard. It's you sh you're shaky and it's a long day afterwards. So a very close eye and then you get comfortable again and he has some time of stability and you're, you kind of forget and then happens again. And that just makes me appreciate the moment even more, the good times. The fact that he's doing so well at this very second is about all I can ask for. What advice would you have for a dad who's in the beginning, maybe first year of their journey, being a father to a kid like Tens? Hang in there. Just love them like you normally do and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do with him? Uh, I don't know. We just kind of have fun just sitting here and making faces at each other or um, he likes it when I snore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we just, we just like hanging out. If there's another kid about your age who just had a younger sibling who became medically disabled, what advice would you have for them? Work with it. Work with it and do the best you can to help them. What is the most important thing you want others to know about Titans? That he understands. That he's here, he understands, and he should be talked to like a person. He's, you know, he, I think there's a stereotype with children that are disabled and nonverbal, and it's, oh, they're so cute, and then it's kind of talk for them and talk about them, but he likes to be talked to. Hey! I'm really happy I get to be here with you today. You're just doing great in this interview. Hey, thank you for reaching out and saying hello. I appreciate you reaching out and saying hello. That was really nice of you. It's so nice to be here with you today. I'm having so much fun getting to know you, hanging out. I think my favorite part about hanging out with you is how you communicate in so many different ways. Like you're smiling, you're tapping my shoulder, you're being really sweet that way. You do a great job of communicating all different things. Do you sense a change in his energy when it goes from people talking about him to people directly communicating with oh, him? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he kind of zones out and, you know, like whatever. They're just having conversations like any kid would when, you know, two adults or somebody's talking and it's not about them. But then when you address him and you say, hey, Tens, do you want to join in the conversation? You want to talk to mommy? Yeah? What do you want to talk about? You got things to say? Yeah, he becomes more engaged and yeah, he just, he likes to be a part of things. My birthday is February 4th. February 4th? My friends make me work hard. I'm really happy that you told me your birthday. Now I'm I can- eight years old. You're eight years old. You're growing up. Thank you for telling me all this stuff. I appreciate you sharing all these cool things about you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I 
I'm eight years old. Eight is such a cool age. You're growing up so fast, too. I'm eight years old. We do know, like, his teacher will hold up several different letters. Just, you know, not even on his eye gaze, but just several different letters. Ask him which letter is which. Inside. And he will answer with his eye gaze. And he um, did state test scores that way and got 100% on all the letters and 100% on his numbers and 100% on his shapes. So, you know, they told us he wouldn't be able to learn with his brain Inside. injury. But he is learning every day on how to do things and figure things out in his own way. What are you most proud of Penns for? I am just proud of Tens for his, his personality being there, that, that little fighter, and um, the happiness with which he embraces life each day. He is a very happy guy, and he's always, because of the 1P36 deletion syndrome, he's never been verbal. He was never able to really communicate, so he's always communicated with his face more than anything else, and that's something he's definitely retained, and he just, I mean, this is... He loves being in front of the camera. This is like his dream day is to just have a photo shoot of himself all day. There we are! Two buddies hanging out. I'm really happy that you like cameras. You like putting on a show for everybody? Ta-da! 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 Does he like when people smile and laugh with him? Mm -hmm. He loves hearing laughing. He also really likes when people cry. He finds that very amusing, especially if his brother's crying. He's a big fan of Breck and getting into trouble, huh? Is it easy for you to make your brother smile? Yes. What do you do? <laughs> he likes it when I cry. I mean, it's... Yeah, there it is. Uh, and me reading to him... Uh, yeah. Why do you think he likes it when you cry? I don't have any idea. So let me get this straight. He likes to see you cry, and he makes you self-destruct in Minecraft. I'm starting that to see a pattern much here. That sums it up. Do you think that's why he fights so hard? Because he loves so many people? Oh, I think it's because so many people love him. And he feels that love and that energy, and he just wants to be there. He wants to have part of that. And his family in particular, he just, they, they're there for him and he knows it. And I think it's a reward to them. What advice would you have for other parents who just learned that their child has end stage lung disease or end stage heart disease? Oh man, um, doctors don't know everything. Um, it can stabilize. You can be in this end stage for longer than we would think. It, I mean, I, I, you just have to appreciate the moment. You just have to sit back and know that you can still live life. You can still go out and have fun. And um, I kind of thought that there would be like this just constant grief on me, but it's it's not. It's There's a lot of happy. <laughs> so um, it's been, you know, it's hard and it's scary and the thought of losing him is debilitating, but you really learn to appreciate life and the moment and just what you have. So for me, that is, there's a lot of beauty in watching a child die. How would you describe that beauty? Just in finding the love and finding the I'm happy. You really, feelings are more poignant, I guess. You really feel things on a deeper level that I don't think unless you're in this situation, you really understand. 